Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is a more assertive Japan, and our guest is Dr. Uh, David Faust. Dr. Faust has two PhD degrees. Uh, he's a real go-getter, as you can see. One is in statistics, and the other is in political science, with a focus on Japan. So let's get right into it, because time always flies by. You know, it seems to me that, as I recall, the first book I ever read about Japanese politics was called The Japanese Superstate, and it was written by that famous Kodai professor, woman professor, the first woman professor ever appointed to that position at Kodai, T.A. Nakane, who I'm sure is way retired by now. And uh, of course, in those days, Japan was really on the rise, and everybody was beginning to look at Japan as a kind of a model, beginning to be a little envious of Japan. And then came the 1980s. And it, through the early part of the 80s, Japan was really rolling along. There was money everywhere. And, um, companies were getting perhaps a little cocky about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then came 1989 with the recruit scandal. And that was the beginning of a 20 plus year fall from grace. But do we see Japan recovering its national confidence? It, it, it's sort of after it had in the 80s, before the recruit scandal? What's, what's your take? Well, thanks for having me here. Today. Well, you're quite welcome. It's always great to have you. In fact, I should mention to our audience, this is your third visit to Asian yeah. Review, so we're always glad to have you. Yeah, thank you. Um, as far as Japan getting its mojo back, I guess. <laughs> mojo, that's a really good way to put it. <laughs> I, I, I guess I believe there's a lot happening in Japan, and there's great strides being take in terms, taken in terms of making Japan a, uh, a more competitive player in the international arena, uh, economically and uh, in the security front as well. Uh, however, I'm not ready to say that uh, they're back where they were in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, my feeling is those days are gone. Okay. Um, you know, the, Japan's uh, economy I don't think is ever going to be as strong and vital as it was at that time, um, basically because of the demographic problem that they have and, and the way that the uh, uh, lack of new workers coming into the economy is going to affect their GDP and so on. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, do you think Japan's rise to preeminence Peaking in the 80s was artificial? Well, in, in some ways it was because the export model of growth that, that uh, Japan grew on, um, I don't think was ever going to be sustainable because it wasn't always fair. And Japan you know, had huge trade surpluses with the United States and many other countries. and. Other countries were looking for more access to J Japanese markets, and and uh, there was a lot of problems with the trade issues, as you may remember. Right. From the U.S. Has especially had a, a, a lot of uh, tough talks with Japan about that. I don't think um, mature economies can continue to grow on this kind of export-led growth. Um, but Japan has done a lot in terms of developing its consumer markets as uh, as well you know, through the past 20 years. So not quite as export um, dependent as they used to be, but still a lot of their growth comes from export. You know, it, it seems to me that um, the model that you're talking about, it was all based on dumping, mm. blocking out uh, imports from other countries, coming up with real nonsense uh, concerns and checklists, that kind of thing. Like American skis won't work on Japanese snow. Or yeah, right, 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 right. American beef can't be digested by Japanese yeah, intestines. Right. <laughs> right. I, and it seemed that the U.S. was quite willing to tolerate some of that nonsense uh, if they could have X number of military bases in Japan. Yeah. And Japan was... Um, some sort of a security partner. Yeah, I, I agree. That was kind of the the basic deal that you know we would kind of supplement their economy, but 
Japan was going to be our aircraft carrier in the sea there. And uh, I think it was Nakasone who called it that. Right, right. And, you know, it seems to me that while Japan's international image has certainly dimmed uh, since the 80s, there's been a lot of, um, what do we call it, quiet revolution that's gone on domestically within Japanese society. And Japanese civic society has really taken a few leaps forward. You were talking about consumerism yeah. and, and, and other features which um, Japanese just didn't seem to be all that concerned about in the boom boom days of the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, I agree. And in one of the areas that you know, there, there's a lot of push for change now is the role of women. Mm. Um, something that the administration, uh, Abe administration, has taken certain steps to try to address Primarily, I believe, because it affects that big issue of demographics, which I brought up earlier. Um, because women um, haven't been willing to have babies, uh, they, the uh, demographics uh, have continued to weaken. And if women are given, uh, I think, a fair shake in you know, the job, uh, more equal pay, more women who become heads of uh, corporations or board members and so on. This is going to, I believe, it's going to strengthen women's will to participate in the workforce and maybe take on that burden of, of, of birth and, and raising kids and so on. Well, looking at the Japanese experience, the rise to glory, hmm. the tumble, at least relative tumble, I mean, it still is but the third largest economy in the world. Does it have lessons for other countries in Asia, particularly like South Korea, China, Taiwan? Yeah, I, I think uh, all those countries are watching Japan because Japan's not alone in having this uh, problem of an aging population. It's kind of leading the pack, but uh, South Korea, China, Taiwan to a lesser extent, but they're all having this issue of not uh, being able to replace the, the uh, people that are dying with the right. birth rate. And uh, China's going to have a huge problem with this, uh, I, I believe. Um, but, you know, they have a much bigger population to start with. So um, j what Japan does and how they're able to cope with this problem is, is going to be, uh, I think, educational for a lot of countries in the region and other countries around the world that have aging populations. Mm -hmm. They all seem to be hit, too, with this uh, growing inequality of wealth, which yeah. seems to be a manifestation of globalization, as far as I can see. Maybe China hasn't been hit quite as bad but with globalization, but definitely there is inequality of wealth that's right. growing. Too. It's interesting. Japan is the first to climb, the first to tumble. The other climbers, are they going to tumble? I guess we'll just have to keep watching. Yeah. I, I don't think uh, Japan's handled the you know demographic issues you know that that well. I mean, they their culture kind of inhibits them from dealing appropriately with that issue. I mean, they're very closed in terms of you know wanting to see foreigners you know be uh, uh, immigrating into their right. country and so on. And, right. And changing the role of women is something that. A lot of, especially people in the uh, political elite, are resistant to. Right. You've seen this with the uh, recent um, de debate over passing a law for abdication of the right. emperor. Right. Right. Um, they did uh, recently pass a kind of one-off uh, to uh, allow the aging emperor to step down for his son, uh, Crown Prince Naruhito, but. Um, the Democratic Party wanted to get a uh, resolution in there to um, make it so that the princesses were uh, able to maintain their royal status after they marry a uh, commoner mm -hmm. because we're having, they're, they're having fewer and fewer royals because the princesses are marrying out and there aren't that many males. Mm -hmm. Well. There, the Democratic Party had to really push hard against the uh, ruling Liberal Democratic Party to get that resolution tacked on to that 
bill, that one-off bill. And um, so there's a lot of resistance in the current administration to changes that would allow a, a bigger change where maybe women would eventually be able to become the empress. Right. Although historically there was numerous cases of that happened. Right, right. In the old days, in the, the old, old, old days. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. So that, I think that's symbolic of kind of the resistance to the changing roles of women in Japan. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. Now, when you say one-off, I want to make sure you and I understand what you're saying here. They changed the law so that the current emperor could abdicate, but future, would, would, would that opportunity still be open to future emperors, or is it just this one time for the current emperor? Yeah, it's just this one time, and any other emperor in the future will have to have the uh, diet pass a similar resolution, so on. And there, it, this is um, basically because of the conservative positions of members of the administration and, and the uh, Liberal Democratic Party. The uh, public overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly supported a law that would make it permanent, mm. that abdication would be okay in the future. Um, but the uh, traditionalists didn't really want to see that happen. Mm. Interesting. Uh, interesting. Well, let's uh, talk specifically about the leadership of Mr. Abe. And uh, I mean, for so part of Japan's problem has been revolving door prime ministers. Uh, prime minister is around uh, eight months, ten months, maybe a year of his lucky, and then he was gone. And yes. we went through so much of that. And then Mr. Abe, who was part of the revolving door <laughs> phenomenon at one time, came 2006, back. 2006, 2007. Yeah. yeah. Got yeah. his act together. And he's been a, uh, a pretty strong leader, it seems. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's accomplished a great deal, um, both economically uh, with his Abe no Abenomics program, mm -hmm. although it hasn't been as successful as he would have hoped, I'm sure. Uh, but also with kind of reasserting Japan's um, presence on the international stage mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, his, his moves in Asia, especially to uh, reassure other countries in the region that Japan is going to remain a major player economically and in terms of security, uh, I think have been remarkable. <laughs> You know, it is, it, it's interesting, though, as you were saying just before the show started, uh, as we were chatting away, um, really Japan needs the United States. And, and other countries in Asia do, too. China's just too big. Yeah. Uh, it's too big. It's increasingly powerful. It's, the, the, the wealth of China is always seems to be a question mark to me. You know, just how much money can China spend on this, that, and the other thing. And the debt is rising. But it doesn't seem to phase anybody. Um, and perhaps compared to other countries in Asia, it's, it's deeper pocketed. Yes. Um, so countries in Asia really do need a, an alliance with the US or some other power. Um, now, one of the most controversial things about Mr. Abe has been his push for constitutional reform, uh, specifically yes. Article 9. And could you bring us up to date on that? Well, um, they are looking to uh, bring a draft proposal of a uh, revision of the Constitution um, to uh, the Diet in the f late, uh, late this year sometime, in the, um, possibly in the fall. That was the plan. And this, this revision is um, from reports uh, that I read, is going to basically state that the self-defense forces are legitimate you know that they the constitution does allow for the self-defense forces to make them a military because you know under the article 9 of the constitution japan was to renounce war as a right. way of resolving differences as well as not maintain military forces and japan does maintain military forces it's Got one of the strongest militaries in Asia. Right. So, you know, to rectify this obvious in inconsistency, um, Abe is focused on that 
as a reason to revise the uh, Constitution. Um, some folks who are a little wary of this think that this might be, you know, just a, a reasonable way of opening the door to uh, further changes. And uh, so there's people that are still opposed to this. But I, I've seen polls that show the majority of, of Japanese believe it's okay to amend the Constitution to state that the SDF is, is legitimate. Well, this is a really good point, and this is also a really a good place for us to take a break. Mm -hmm. So you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. David Faust. Our show, A More Assertive Japan. And uh, we'll be right back, so don't go away. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Landing all week for the day of the big day. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DD. Captain of our team. It's a DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. David Faust. Um, our show today, A More Assertive Japan. And just before the break, we were getting into the uh, really interesting topic about Japanese constitutional revision, specifically focusing on Article 9. So let's uh, pick it up from there. So um, just before we went to break, you were saying that the Jap uh, that according to polling that you've seen, the Japanese public is willing to um, accept some changes in the wording of Article Nine to reckon effectively recognize the SDF as a legitimate military force. Yeah, I want to be very clear. What I, I believe I've read is is that the first two paragraphs will stay as is. Okay, but. In addition to that, you have recognition uh, that the Japanese military forces are legitimate. What about the part of Article 9 that says, uh, we the Japanese people renounce, what is it, the right of war or right. war? Is that going to still be there? That, yeah, my understanding is that would not change, okay. nor, nor the part that says that we won't maintain military forces, which doesn't really jibe as far as, you know, how, how do you say that the SDF is a legitimate military force if Japan isn't supposed to maintain those forces. Right. Um, so, so in, in my view, something has to give there. Something. Right. So the second paragraph, I would think, would have to change. But um, it's not really clear. Um, lots of different changes have been proposed by the Liberal Democratic Party in, in the uh, past, and it's... it's uh, what, what they're going to end up doing is kind of open to question, or whether, whether or not they're going to get there, given the recent thumping that the uh, Prime Minister's party took in the election just this past weekend right. in the Tokyo Municipal uh, uh, met Metropolitan Election. Hmm, that's interesting. But he still has a solid majority in both the upper house and in the lower house. Yes, he's, he's got the best uh, situation anybody's had in, in many, many years to try to push through basically anything he wants. The problem is that uh, recently he pushed through an anti-conspiracy law that really angered a lot of people. It was supposed to deal with terrorism, um, but how it, it, uh, it was so vague and broad that many people feel it's, it's going to impinge on people's privacy rights. Even the uh, UN Rapporteur for uh, Privacy Rights uh, wrote about uh, this being, you know, they need to redo this, they need to rework this. And uh, I, I saw reports that things like um, picking mushrooms in forests uh, that are preserves will be, you know, considered, you know, conspiracy under, under 
to commit terrorism under this law, um, illegal bicycle racing. Uh, there was just all kinds of things thrown into this bill. And, it, and the people, although they're split on whether they need it or not, uh, the vast majority believes it was just rushed through. Hmm. That's and, and that's the problem with having both houses and nobody really to, to block you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he has the uh, votes if he, he gets to that point where he gets his, his constitutional revision on the table. It's, it's, it's possible that he could do this. Uh, however, Abe is going to now, uh, because of this thumping he took in this weekend's elections, he's going to start facing challenges from inside his own party uh, for leadership. And, uh, you know, he, he was on his way to becoming the longest serving prime minister in post war history. Uh, he, he may still get there, but um, with this anti uh, conspiracy law being very unpopular, mm -hmm. uh, he has a scandal of influence peddling that involves him and a bunch of his team members. Uh, his wife was even pulled into this. Um, this is one of the reasons he took the thumping in this election. Uh, he, he's not been really open to investigating that uh, uh, scandal. So Abe is a little bit, you know, he, he's a little bit weak right now. Vulnerable? He's vulnerable, yeah. And who would, his, who would his number one contender be? It used to be said that Asso was really interested in being prime minister, but I, I haven't heard his name mentioned recently. Well, I, I think um, the guy that he ran against was um, Ishiba, who okay. was a former uh, defense minister. When he won in 2012, he's, he would still be a top contender. Um, this, uh, some people might think this governor of Tokyo, uh, Yoriko uh, Koike, she used to be defense minister also. Yes, yeah. she was part of the LDP as well. And she, she left them and started this uh, Tomin First no Kai, as a, uh, as a Tokyo Residence First. Okay. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no, no, no. She doesn't have links there, does she? <laughs> <laughs> she she's pretty conservative, but she's very popular, and she, she is a kind of a populist. And... Uh, so people are talking about her possibly, you know, taking the, her popularity to the national level. Um, she's somebody you would have to consider, but uh, various uh, uh, people in the top levels of the LDP, I believe, will probably run. So what about Asso? Is he gone now? Is he faded away? I don't, I don't he think he's a... Fallen from graves? Yeah, or? I don't think he's a top contender for the prime minister's office. That's, okay. that's my view. Oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. Well, um, Abe certainly um, really wanted the U.S. to stay with TPP. Yeah. And uh, probably was pretty disappointed when Trump came out and said, well, we're pulling out of TPP. And now the story is that Japan seeks to leave TPP. Did Japan do that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I remember Abe saying uh, shortly after Trump was elected that without the U.S., TPP would be meaningless. Mm. And uh, he seems to have kind of changed his tune on that one a bit. And yeah, I have seen that he's thinking now that maybe Japan needs to assert leadership in, in pulling this off. I'm skeptical uh, about that, um, whether Japan could offer the type of incentives you know, the, the market incentives to some of the uh, countries like Vietnam and mm. Malaysia and so on that the U.S. would offer, you know, to make this thing work. Um, I know Japan's going to double its efforts in um, the regional uh, comprehensive economic partnership, RECEP, mm -hmm. uh, which China is, is the kind of the lead on that. And it's been kind of thought of as a competitor to the TPP. And, Japan's probably going to try to look to counter them inside of RECEP as well, but uh, I don't, well, I don't I, think they I, I have the weight. I understand that. Will Japan join RECEP no, or they will seek already, to counter it? I think they're, a part of, they're already part of it, but they will, they're going to probably double their efforts to try to counter China's leadership inside of RECEP, okay. as well as trying to revive the TPP. Um, but you know, there, there are going to be some obstacles, I think, to really getting a, a TPP to, to uh, 
succeed now. Has, has Japan joined in on the China's big project at the moment, the One Belt, One Road? Um, I think they're not as, as involved as many other countries. They're okay. more waiting and watching. And, um, you know, most of the other countries in the region, including, uh, I think, South Korea, others are very interested in this. As far as I recall, Japan did not join the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. No. Along with the United States, yeah. stayed off. Good, good ally. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, um, we're sort of running down here on time, uh, but um, let's just talk for a minute about the South China Sea, because it seems Japan wants to assert more influence on the South China Sea as well. Yeah, yeah Southeast Asia and South China Sea in general has is, is become, a, it seems, a major focus of Japan. Um, once again, both economically and in terms of security cooperation, I've seen Japan uh, raising the amount of foreign direct investment that it's sending into like some of the top uh, ASEAN economies, and uh, on the uh, security front, they've uh, have this. Uh, I think it was last November they announced this uh, Vientian uh, Vision, this mm -hmm. initiative that they have for security cooperation. Basically, nothing new coming forward, but. Uh, uh, a, a framework for what they're doing with ASEAN in terms of security cooperation, you know, all across the spectrum in terms of just uh, having uh, HADR or humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, and peacekeeping operation training with each other, um, capacity building of various types. Uh, then there's like uh, Japan's new emphasis on providing uh, technology transfers. Mm -hmm which since 2014 they've been able to do because of changes in the law. And that I, I see as a major emphasis and something that the Southeast Asian countries are very interested in. Uh, they've been doing this a lot with the Philippines and Indonesia as well. Um, you know, the patrol boats, uh, mm -hmm. Japan's focus is on the maritime uh, right. domain and, and maintaining rule of law right. in, in that area. Well, I've just been told that the clock has caught up with us again, <laughs> so I guess we're going to have to stop it here, but there's so much more we could yeah. talk about. Uh, that always seems to be the case, or the quandary that we fall into. Yeah. So I want to thank you very much for coming back and joining us thank for you. the third time, and I want to thank you for watching today, and we'll see you next week.